Hi, thanks for watching another video in our series in which we are moving through the Bible from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation. And through this series, hopefully we will discover uh, how to understand our story better within his story. How do these Old Testament uh, stories and characters and events, uh, how does that affect our lives today? How do we live um, the, the lessons? Or what are the lessons? And then how do we live them? How does that affect us in our faith today? And of course, we started at uh, the beginning with creation. That's a good place to start. And how God spoke everything into existence, that everything was perfect, that the relationship with God and, and, and his creation was perfect until what we call the fall, where the serpent comes in and he tricks Eve into doing the one thing that God told them not to do. The one thing he said, don't do this. And that's the one thing that they did. And we talked about how Satan is still just as crafty today that uh, he still uses the same excuses. He tries to get us to doubt uh, what God has told us. And, and he slides through and he manipulates God's word. Just like when he said to Eve, did God really say you couldn't eat from any of the trees? Well, that wasn't true. What God said was don't eat from this one particular tree. But Satan comes and he twists those words and he tricks her. And of course, Adam was standing there uh, off to the side watching. And when she didn't die like God said she would, then he took a bite of it. And, and here we are all these years later, uh, suffering from the fallout of their decisions. But then we fast forward to just a few chapters to uh, the flood. We're introduced to Noah and his family. And God says that every thought, every inclination of mankind was evil. And so he regretted his creation. He wished he never made him. So he decides to start all over. He decides to destroy his creation, save Noah and his family, and start all over. And so uh, last time we left off, uh, we thought, you think, hey, everything's going, going well. You know, God had destroyed everything, started over, fresh start. Uh, except the problem was when we left off last time, uh, all of mankind had collected this place called Babel, and they decided to make a name for themselves. And even though we are still at the beginning of the Bible, a pattern has already developed. See, people sin, uh, people face the consequences, God redeems. And then after God redeems, people sin, people face the consequences, God redeems. As we've already seen, because of the fall, the world was broken. The relationship with God was broken. But God is a God who fixes what is broken. Like I said, we ended last time with the picture of not looking so good. They wanted to make a name for themselves. Even though God had redeemed, here they were still uh, defying God to make a name for themselves. And so God had to confuse their speech and spread them out uh, to get them away from each other. They had not followed what God had told them to do once again, but just when you think humanity has no hope, God launches a plan of redemption that was global. He was going to create a people for himself that would embody and spread his salvation to every group of people on earth. And that's a plan that is still being followed today, a plan that all of us have a role to play in. We're all in that plan right this very minute. If you're watching this video, you are serving in that plan right this very minute. And God sets his plan into motion by calling one man, living in the middle of an idol-worshipping nation. He calls him away from everything he knew. And then he promises to change the very course the of Lord history had said to Abram, through leave him. Leave your native country. You're We're introduced to that man in Genesis family, chapter 12. go to the land that I will show nine verses. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife, Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran, and headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up camp beside the oak of Moreh. At that time, the area was inhabited by Canaanites. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. After that, Abram traveled south and set up camp in the hill country with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. There he built another altar and dedicated it to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord. Then Abram continued traveling south by stages toward the Negev. The story of Abraham is quite an incredible story. 
whether it's the story of Abram leaving his home with all that he owned or, or God making the covenant with Abram uh, or Abraham and Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah or, or Abraham being uh, required by God to sacrifice his son Isaac, it's apparent that Abraham is on a journey of faith. Sarah was 65 years old and Abraham was 75 years old when God called them on this journey of faith. In our time together, I want to look at this journey and see what we can learn about our own journey. Have any of you ever played fantasy football? Have you ever heard of fantasy football? Uh, maybe you haven't. Well, real quick, fantasy football is where you can draft uh, any players that currently play in the NFL and put them on your fake team. Uh, yes, it's pretend. Yes, it is fake. Uh, but no one ever talks about that. We like to call it fantasy instead of fake football. But then teams play against each other and you see who wins at the end. I wasn't really into fantasy football until uh, just a few years ago when I decided I wanted to play with uh, some of the, the, the youth guys. And uh, then I got hooked and I kind of got addicted to it. Uh, but anyways, um, Fantasy football is, is interesting, it's fun to watch, but something that, that shocks me every year still, or surprises me is, is that no one ever picks me to be on their team. Uh, every year I put my name out there and no one ever selects me to be on their football team. I mean, what makes uh, me any less important or, or makes me not as good as Tom Brady or uh, you know, Patrick Mahomes or Dak Prescott or, or Deshaun Watson? Or, you know, what, what makes them any better than me? Well, okay, okay, you may say I don't play for an NFL team, but I could walk onto the Saints practice field tomorrow and make the team, right? Couldn't I? Well, hopefully you're not laughing at that uh, because you and I both know if I walked onto a football field and tried to be a walk-on for a team, the chances of me making the team are slim to none. And if you think about that, you can kind of guess of what it had to feel like for God to pick Abraham. I mean, let's put it out there. Abraham was old. If you and I were picking a couple to start a new nation, we'd probably pick a young, healthy, strong couple who can run triathlons and rescue kittens from burning buildings. But God chose Abraham. But see, when you read through the Bible, he's not the only one that leaves you scratching your head. I mean, yeah, Abraham was old, but Jacob was insecure, Leah was unattractive, Joseph was a slave, Moses was a stutterer, Gideon was poor, Samson was prideful, uh, Rahab was a prostitute, David had an affair, Elijah was suicidal, Jeremiah was depressed, uh, let's see, who else? Jonah ran from God, Naomi was a widow, and, and see, that's just the short list from the Old Testament. You go into the New Testament, you see John the Baptist was eccentric, to say the least. Peter had temper issues. Martha worried a lot. The Samaritan woman had several failed marriages. Zacchaeus was hated. Thomas had doubt. And Paul had poor health. And the list goes on and on and on. And yet God used every one of them to do something amazing. When you go through and read the Bible, you see that God's fantasy football team was a joke. It was terrible. Unless you look at the end score, look at the end of the season, and Abraham and Moses and David are still being talked about today. See, God uses the unlikely to do the unthinkable. The world may look at us and say, oh, that's a terrible lineup, but God says, oh man, I want to use you here if. If what? If you just have faith. And everything seems to come back to this word faith, this word for standing on something firm, for stepping out and saying, I completely lay my weight down on you. Abraham was on a journey of faith. We are on a journey of faith. And how do we allow God to use us to do unthinkable things? What does it look like? Well, there are four things that I see in Abraham. First, it always starts with a dream. God begins with a dream or a vision to say, can you imagine this? In Genesis chapter 15, he takes Abraham outside and he tells him to look up at the stars and tells him that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars, that his descendants will be a blessing to the whole earth. God never says, imagine this, everything is going to stay the same way it's always been and nothing will ever change, even 20 years from now. So just keep going like you've been going. No, no, it's always, can you dream of something different? Can you dream of something bigger, something better? 
But I'll tell you something, life has a way of beating the dreams out of you. We hear and, and even tell others, don't get too excited, consider the facts, be realistic. I'm glad there was no one around Abram that day when God called him to leave. Because they might have told him, hey, Abram, be realistic. Face the facts. This is insane. Where are you going? You don't even know. Man, just, just stay right where you are. There's no sense in changing. Come on, man. Because of the outside world, it didn't make sense. The facts pointed to them not following God. Everything said no, but God said go. It's about being, it's not about being real, realistic. It's about being faithful. So you see the dream. God asks you to think of a better future. The next thing you have to do is obey the call. Let's go back and read what we read earlier in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who treat you, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. There are three words that make all the difference. So Abram went. God calls Abraham, and what does Abraham say? Nothing. He doesn't argue with him. He doesn't debate with him. He doesn't say, yeah, but there are no recorded words by Abraham, simply only the words, Abraham went. And that word went is important too, because it's the first verb in Abraham's journey of faith. It's the first thing that he actually does. God challenged Abraham to envision something great, a different type of future. Abraham hears God and goes. An article that I was uh, reading a while back was talking about someone who became a runner after struggling with their weight their whole life. It, it was a good article. The person's story was great. It really made me feel like that I could do that. And So as I read that article, uh, reclined back on the couch, drinking my Diet Dr. Pepper and, and eating my snacks, I thought, man, that, that's a really good story. It makes me feel fast. What's wrong with that story? Well, it's just because you dream about it, just because you read about it, just because you think about it. It's not going to change your world until you do something about it, until you obey God and actually go. God may be asking you, do you dream of something better and bigger? Well, do you? Do you dream of a future where you make an impact on the lives around you? Where you make a difference in the world? A greater relationship with God, maybe. Maybe dream of a better relationship with others. God says, that's great. I can make that happen. Just obey when I call you. Step out when I tell you. Do the right thing when it's in front of you. It really comes down to making the decision to do what God wants regardless of what I want. And see, we've all made that commitment. We've all said, God, I want to follow you and I'm willing to go wherever I want to go. Wait, that's not the commitment we made. And yet that's the commitment that we live. Is that, God, I want to follow you and I will go wherever I want to go. Okay, fine. I committed to go wherever you wanted to go. So I will go wherever you want me to go as long as it's where I want to go. <laughs> no, instead we should be saying, I will go wherever you want me to go, even if that's not where I want to go. You ever heard of a backseat driver? Oh, they are the worst. You know, those people who say, sure, go ahead and drive and then tell you everything to do while you're driving or everything that you're doing wrong. Uh, I thought we should have turned there. Why don't we turn back here? You're going too fast. You're going too slow. You didn't fully stop at that red light. You know, on and on and on. And it's easy to get aggravated at a backseat driver or a passenger seat driver. But we do the same thing to God. We say, sure, God, you can drive. I'm leaving the will in your hands. And before long, we're saying, um, God, shouldn't we turn here? Why didn't we turn back there? Why are we going here? Where are we going? Um, I think you're going too fast. I don't think you're going fast enough. Uh, God, can we pump the brakes a little bit here? I don't like this. Maybe you should just slow things down. See, we do the same thing to God. We tell him we trust him. And yet in our actions, we backseat drive him. Well, back to Abraham. We, we need to see the dream, then we need to obey the call, and next, we need to believe the enabler. 
Abraham and Sarah and all their family were called to leave their home, which is basically modern day Baghdad, uh, and travel about 700 miles. And when they got to the land that God had promised, there was a famine there. So they ended up traveling down to Egypt. All in all, it was about 20 years after God called them that they were moving towards the promise. Have you ever waited 20 years in faith for God to do something? Some of you watching this may not even be 20 years old. Have you waited a year? Have you waited six months? I mean, 20 years, good grief, most of us don't want to wait 20 minutes, much less 20 years. Because we're a society of right here, right now, right? Some of us remember dial-up internet. Of course, some of you also remember no internet, but some of us remember dial-up internet when you had to take, it took forever to connect and you had to listen for the sound and then it would finally connect. And after about 20 minutes of trying, you're finally on the internet. But please, nobody pick up the phone because somebody picked up the phone, it disconnected, you had to start all over again. But we were willing to wait. Now, if it takes five seconds to pull up a page on my phone, I get frustrated and walk away. Not worth it. Because we are accustomed to getting what we want when we want it right now. See, we have to trust, we have to believe the enabler. What we need to remember is delay does not mean denying. Abraham and Sarah waited. Now, they did get a little impatient there and decided to push things along. And so Sarah offered Hagar, her uh, handmaiden, offered Hagar to Abraham and said, here, you can have a child with her. We can fulfill the promise that way. And they ended up having Ishmael. But God says, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm, that's not how I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to make this happen. See, you're trying to make my promise happen. But I promised it, which means I'm going to make it happen. And this is not my plan. See, here's the thing. Trusting God means that we have faith that he is never going to abandon us, that he will see us through. Faith is not microwavable. Oh, we love a microwave, don't we? Because if you can cook something without having to do the whole oven thing, that is great. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't even have time for the oven to preheat. I hit the preheat button. I put whatever I'm putting in on the pan. I slide it in there for it's ever preheat. Because my thinking is, as it's preheating, it's also cooking, which cuts my time down, right? See, if we can put it in the microwave, though, slide it in the microwave, nuke it, be done with it. Who cares if it doesn't taste as good? Who cares if it's soggy? It's done and I can eat. Well, our faith is not microwavable. Okay? We can't just snap our fingers and have it done. or We can't rush the process along because in faith, we say, it may not happen now, but I can wait. Let's see, we get blinded. Paul, in Romans chapter 4, he talks about Abraham. And even after all those years, and he talks about how Abraham still had hope, even when there seemed to be no hope. But in verse 19, it says, Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. I love that word, facts. We want facts. We want to live by facts. Don't give us theories. Give us facts. Be realistic about the facts. But there's, there's a tiny problem with facts. And there's not, now, facts in themselves are not wrong. They're not evil. And yes, we should, we should strive to, to want to know the facts and not live our life outside of facts. But here's the tiny problem with facts. And that is sometimes God changes the facts. Okay? The fact was Abraham was old. He was as good as dead. <laughs> That's really uplifting, by the way. But he chose to believe that God would be true to his promise. Abraham said, I'm old. Sarah's old. We're as good as dead. That's the facts. But I'm trusting in a God who can change the facts. We think we have it all figured out simply because we have all the facts. We say this disease is incurable and God might say, oh yeah, watch me. We might say, oh, that addiction is impossible to overcome. And God says, watch what I do with them. We might say, this relationship isn't repairable. And God says, I can fix it. We say things like, fact is, people don't want to hear about God anymore. Fact is, they'll think I'm crazy. Fact is, I don't know what I'm talking about. And God says, let me use you. Just let me use you. Abraham believed more in the Father than he did the facts. Are there any facts that are scaring you right now? I'm not saying throw caution to the wind and do something completely idiotic, but I am saying is that God's call is for us not to trust in us, but to trust in Him. 
when it comes to our own journey of faith, if we want to be more like Abraham in his faith, then we need to see the dream. We need to envision bigger, to see a better future than what we have already. And then we need to obey the call, not just see it and say, oh, that'd be nice, but actually move on it. Something that's very important in this process is prayer. I don't know about you, but it's something that I struggle with. Um, I struggle with knowing that God hears my prayers, knowing that, that God is, is concerned and cares about the things that I care about. I have a hard time uh, with prayer. But I, I know this, the times that I have prayed and then lived it's, as though it's going to happen, it happened. We should go before God and lay it down before him. We need to pray and then live as though it's going to happen. And even when we think that things are not moving at our speed, we need to believe the enabler, that God will bring about what's best for us and for, uh, for his church, especially at a time like this, as long as we are actively seeking his will. I wish I could stop there because the last one is the most difficult thing about Abraham's life for me to read. See, the fourth thing, and this is hard, but we should keep trusting him even when we're tested. God promised Abraham a son, and a son he got. The Bible says it was some time later. We don't know exactly how long, but scholars think it might have been about 15 years. So Isaac was at least a teenager, if not older by this time, when we read Genesis chapter 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had, had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance, and he said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father? Abraham replied, Yes, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham! And he replied, Here I am. The angel said, Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Because now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Did you hear what he told his son? God will provide. That's faith, even in the face of testing. See, testing can come in many ways. It won't always look the same. Maybe you're tested uh, to do the right thing in your workplace or even in your families or with your friends. Maybe you're being tested relationally. Maybe you're, you're being tested in various ways. Maybe, especially right now, the church uh, as a whole not just our congregation, but the entire church is being tested. But faith comes when we know that no matter what we are being tested with, if we are faithful to him, then he will see his people through. When I read the story of Abraham being tested, I couldn't imagine how it felt uh, sacrificing his son. How did he feel? What were his emotions? I have three kids, and some days, man, they push it. But I know that if anything were ever to happen to them, I would lay down my life in an instant for them. I would do everything I could to give them life. But to take life from them? Thank God I don't have to, and thank God Abraham didn't have to. But you see, Abraham and Isaac are just another example of a precursor. They're, they're foreshadowing. They're pointing us to something else. Because you know Abraham didn't have to sacrifice his son, but God did. He sacrificed his son for us. 
The thing is, that mountain where Abraham was tested on, that same mountain that many years later a little town called Jerusalem will be built, and just outside Jerusalem is where God did not spare his own son like he did Abraham's. No, God gave him so that we could spend eternity with him. And so the challenge is, do you want to walk in the steps of Abraham? Maybe you struggle with just one of those areas, or maybe all of them. Maybe you can dream big, but you have a hard time stepping out in faith. Maybe you can step out, but you just have a hard time waiting. Or, or maybe you're being tested right now. The only way to make it through the testing, the only way to walk in faith is to believe the enabler and trust that he will see you through. We're all on this journey of faith, and we can be led by ourselves, we can be led by others, by what's popular, by what's easiest, or we can be led by a loving God who's been leading his people this whole time. That's the story of Abraham. Next time, we're going to talk about the story of Isaac. And it's not really as encouraging a story of Abraham because Isaac's walk with God is much different than Abraham's. But that's for next time. Until then, have a blessed week.